It was just sitting out there, and years ago I had done a core of discovery reenactment. And I've always been fascinated with Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. So how did I choose these people? Um, I was just thinking it was at Mount Rushmore where the park ranger um, was from Greensboro. And I was there with, you know, the tour and doing whatever. And he lit up, I'll tell you more about this next week, the faces of the presidents at night, one at a time, and talked a little bit about not the things that we know, but how their decisions impacted the country. You know, Washington does this, Jefferson this, Lincoln that, Roosevelt this. And it hit me, what about a lecture series on, like, American leaders? Names that we've all heard, but what exactly did they do that made them household names? And I was trying to run the gamut of, like, colonial history to civil war to, to modern. And I just kept you know, like running names through, through my head, and I would bark them out every now and then and get some feedback. Lewis and Clark hit me right away, because their story, people know what they did, but they may not know what actually went into it. And then there was the, the, the four presidents that I'm going to call um, Foundation, Expansion, Conservation, and Preservation. Or flip flop those last two. And then like, who else? Haven't very rarely talked about ladies all that much, so I wanted to get important ladies in, so I picked. Um, Martha Washington, because I'll get Oh, I got some for you. I have two things for you, actually. All right, all right here you go. You're welcome. Um, you want to say hello? Thank you for coming. Yeah. The PTSA right. and Ms. Malik, I really appreciate your support. If there's no one here, I would be embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> all right, there we go. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just saw a news feed that um, the last Bedford boy passed away. Oh, no. Oh, man. All right. well, I'll tell you that story, too, while, while, while we're at it. So, um, up the road in Virginia, Bedford, Virginia, is the National D-Day Memorial. And we've I've been over the last 10 years or so, done a lot of work with them. And they were the first guys ashore on Omaha Beach. Um, they were down a little bit from the famous Saving Private Ryan Beach. They hit, at, it's called the Veerville Draw right into the heart of where the German defenses were. And so the last Bedford boy, 91% of them were killed within the first um, 10 of every male between 17 and 35 in the town were wiped out in 10 minutes. And so the last one just died. That stinks. So anyway, um, uh, back to this. Um, so did Martha Washington, because she does a lot of stuff behind the scenes very few people know. Clara Barton. And then Sakaga Wea and Harriet Tubman. And then I wanted to get, you know, some of the iconic guys. So I, in World War II, we got Bradley, Eisenhower, and Patton. Not so much like the war drives them, but it's some of the big decisions that they make. And at the end, I wanted to finish up with a common man, like normal, everyday Joe Schmoes, who have a large impact on American history. And so I came up with Joshua Chamberlain. Um, from Maine, uh, Richard Winters from Pennsylvania, who was in World War II, and then a young World War I guy named Jack Barkley, who some of you may remember from, from last year. There should be a movie made about this guy, but there hasn't been. And it's just the things that they do, kind of subtly or in large scale, pretty much change and shape America. So that's how I, and there were so many names, like I was thinking of John Glenn, you know, Alan Shepard, you know, Wilburn Orville Wright, but I needed some stories to go behind it, so here we go. So, um, Lewis and Clark, um, everybody knows that they went on this journey, but not a lot of people really know what went, who they were or what went on behind the scenes. And both um, were born in Virginia, um, very close to, you know, in and around Albemarle County, um, UVA territory for the Bolins back there. Um, and so they were Virginia aristocrats. That's just who they were. And Lewis um, is a star, you know, he's the, the, the kind of the head of the show. He's born in 1774, and he dies when he's only 35. And you may know, I don't know what his um, death was like. It's very sad he only made it to 35. A lot of people think he suffered 
from some type of um, depression. He was kind of a loner. He was always off by himself. And when you hear the story, imagine giving unprecedented authority by your boss, the president, where for three or four years, you're in charge. There is no chain of command. It's you. You do this incredible thing that no one thinks you can do. You pull it off almost flawlessly, and then you get back. Like, like what do you do? Like, I got to go to an everyday nine to five job. I got to take orders. So it was this very, very um, hard on him. Um, he's a politician. He's a soldier. He's an intellectual, and the thing that he is best at is being an, an explorer. And he was handpicked, and I have this fantasy, hey guys, how you doing? Um, that Thomas Jefferson, we'll talk more about him next week too. If you've ever been to Monticello, there's that glass booth, like sitting out looking o over the valley. And I think that there, Jefferson was just so smart, like who were his peers? And so it's kind of lonely, he kind of stands out there in his little glass phone booth just thinking because, like, who was he? I mean, the man took temperature readings twice a day, you know, for like 60 years, wherever he was in, in, in the world. So but he was handpicked, Meriwether Lewis was handpicked by Thomas Jefferson to take a journey that made, makes him famous. And his buddy Clark is just a little bit older, and if you, you know, look between the, the two portraits, the guys sometimes could have passed for, for brothers. They were both about the same height, a little over six foot. They were kind of tall and lanky. Descriptions of them moving across the field said they looked fluid and smooth like a deer running. So think of a highly tuned athlete. These guys are just walking, doing their thing, equal in about in every way. So Clark lives much longer and is much more successful in later life than his buddy Lewis is. Um, he will wind up being the governor of the largest territory as the country is expanding in American history. So Clark kind of comes back and really takes off where Lewis kind of sinks. The two guys verge in um, September of 1806 when they return home. So together, these guys lead one of the most incredible journeys from St. Louis, Missouri, all the way over to you know, Washington, the Washington-Oregon border. Um, this trip is 8,000 miles long. And the crazy thing is, the French owned this territory. Nobody knew, no white person, shall we say, knew what was here. It literally was like it's called the heart of darkness. No one knew what was out there. There could be dinosaurs. Our, our volcanoes erupting, woolly mammoths are still running around. No one had ever gone recorded coast to coast before. So their job, and the way Jefferson describes it, is you are going to explore the territory of Louisiana. Basically, we wanted this. All right? This was going to be America's. In so doing, he viewed it as scientific research. I want you to find an all-water route to the Pacific, if possible. You to our established contact with the natives, but we don't know how many they are, and can we find someone to speak their language? We're really not sure. While you're doing that, you are going to collect scientific data on all the flora and fauna, all the plants and animals you see, catalog them, research them, and send them back to me. This is what your task is. You're not just going out there on a hunting trip. You have to do actual work daily. So Lewis, as a young boy, you can see his life being shaped early on. His dad dies when he's around six or, or seven. Now, they were very wealthy, had a big plantation in a place called Locust Hill. And his mom quickly re remarries. It's kind of like an uncle slash friend. And the family is going to move to Georgia for several years. And on the way out, you got to remember that there were no really roads or trails. You know, there, there were some, but you know, once you get you know, towards Georgia, things get very, very, very rural. Um, they're attacked by Cherokee Indians. And the settlers who aren't woodsmen are getting picked off by, by arrows, and they're standing by a big fire. So their silhouette is lighting up all over the woods, so the Indians are picking them off. 
And it's the young seven or eight year old Lewis who gets up with some water, douses the flame, and knocks over the logs. They're like, what'd you do that for? We can't see. And he's like, well, yeah, and neither can they. Oh, all right. So right away, you see he's, he's calm, he's cool under pressure, he can think, and this young kid pretty much saves um, the rest of the villagers or settlers who, who were not killed from that point on. Young age, he liked to get up early and hunt. It was him and usually a dog out in the woods, hunting, moving around, doing um, whatever. So, um, one thing about him that set him apart from everybody else, and here's where he's kind of similar to Jefferson, he had an insatiable curiosity. He wanted to know about everything. How does that work? What does that do? Can you eat that? What's that for? And he spent a lot of time with his mom and a lot of the older, like, midwives and midwives, excuse me, and doctors of the area, learning about different plants, what can make you sick, what can you eat, what can you use for medicine, making drawings, charting animals moving around, all this stuff that we walk, you know, through, you know, Duke Gardens, we're like, yeah, okay, it's a nice bush and some pretty tulips and, you know, but, you know, we don't really know why, why um, everything ticks. So at the age of 13, they decide it's time for him to go back and get a formal education in Virginia. Because if you're going to get educated, it's got to be in Virginia. You're a Virginia gentleman. So he goes back, and he's taught by private tutors for many years, but it turns out that he's pretty much smarter than they are. Oh, yeah, I got that. Oh, yeah, I got that. So he winds up having his stepfather and some friends chip in, and he graduates from Washington University, now Washington and Lee University. He's got this great, you know, academic stature behind him, but yet when he's not reading or learning, he's always out in the woods doing something. So, um, when he's 18, he inherits Locust Hill. He has this giant plantation to run. It is now his job as a man to run the family farm. He's got to take care of his mother as his stepfather died, a younger brother and a younger sister. He's got a bunch of slaves and 2,000 acres of land and hundreds of head of livestock to take care of. It's a pretty daunting task for an 18-year-old. But Lewis at first loves it. Here he learns how to be a good manager, how to get people, even though they were slaves, you can't just you know, bark at them constantly, how to get work done, how to prioritize. We've got to do this now. And then with that is a whole subset of skills he has to learn. First thing is, you know, we got to grow the crops, the corn, you know, the tobacco that's going to feed and support the family. Plus, we've got to get hay for the livestock and, you know, this, that, making you know, how to preserve the food, when to grow the food, how to smoke the hams, how to skin the animals, how to be a blacksmith, how to be a, a doctor, how to fix a rifle, how to fix farm implements, how to be a carpenter, all these things he has to learn, because in his mind, I can't have somebody do it if they don't know how. So I've got to teach them and show them. Then I've got to look it over to make sure the job was done well. Keep in mind, he's only 18. And his passion and his hobby this time, at this time, and he was looking for ways to conserve and renew the soil. Is it crop rotation? Is it manure fertilizer? If I plow the field in this direction, will less soil erode? All these things are running through his head for several years. And it's great. It's like a giant Rubik's Cube jigsaw puzzle for him to figure out. But when he's doing that, that stupid moth flying around. <laughs> Kill that thing. All right. um, he doesn't have time to go and like hunt and play in the woods and check stuff out, and so he feels trapped. It's just, ah, he knows it's his duty, but this, you know, after a while, it's just boring. Like, there's no new challenge. I've got it figured out once it's up and running. And, you know, I don't have to do this all the time. So he's looking for um, an outlet, but all those skills will help him as he goes on the famed core of discovery. So lucky for him, a rebellion breaks out. And it's the famous Whiskey Rebellion where farmers 
out west, you know, Appalachia and over into the Ohio Territory, didn't want to pay taxes on some of the alcohol that they made. And the federal government knew that was a good source of, of, of revenue. But these guys were a long way off from Washington. What are you going to do? Come out and make us pay? Well, President Washington said, well, yeah, actually we are. And there's this big argument over what was so different about what the farmers on the settlements were complaining about no taxation without representation then the guys coming after them making them pay use the same argument against the British but different story for a different day there's a war Virginia gentlemen gotta go so Meriwether Lewis jumps at the chance and he joins the Virginia militia and the army he goes out there are several big battles um, that he takes part in during the Whiskey Rebellion as far away as what is today of the Maumee River in Toledo, Ohio. And he's cited for bravery and handling himself in dangerous situations. So he gets a lieutenant's commission. And he was an honest, trustworthy guy. So he's made a paymaster. He goes up and down, you know, the territories, handing out salaries to officers and soldiers. Because he was a trustworthy soul. This was great for him. He's out in the woods, he's patrolling, he's by himself for a long periods of time, then he gets to meet people who are pretty much like him. Then he gets into a duel one day with a superior officer, and that was strictly forbidden. But Lewis gets out of it and says, hey, I was provoked, he challenged me first, it's not my fault, I won. There's some bad blood, so he sent off to join a regiment of sharpshooters. And it just so happens, Second Lieutenant Meriwether Clark meets, or Meriwether Lewis meets First Lieutenant William Clark, who's like his twin or an older brother. And the two hit it off almost immediately, and they have this lifelong friendship at this point. So we'll take a break. Um, and this was an old Russell painting. I couldn't get it to come in any better. I'm so mad. The famous Rus um, Western painter. It's just the two guys looking the same, standing on a mountaintop overlooking a valley, you know, probably somewhere in North Dakota or, or Utah. But apologize for not getting it clear. Um, but nothing we can do about that now. Um, because of his honesty and the way he conducts himself, Meriwether Lewis had traveled several times to Washington, and the family social blue blood network of Virginia kicks in, and he meets Thomas Jefferson. I heard about you, young man. You're down there, Albemarle County, not too far from me. You're really smart. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You did this. You did that. Boom. Got it. Oh, <laughs> there you go. All right. All right. Um, and so he's like, you know, I need someone just like you. I need a secretary. I'm about to be president. Would you like the job that pays 500 bucks a year? You gotta live with me in the White House. <laughs> Lewis is like, yeah, that sounds fun. You know, what do I gotta do? All right. So he winds up as Jefferson's secretary, and he's privy to some of the writings and the conversations that had gone on in and around the presidency, going back to George Washington, several prominent Americans. Ben Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, Jefferson, Washington, um, Robert Gray, uh, you know, all of these guys were talking about an all-water route to the Pacific. There's got to be one. There's got to be. But the thing that's blocking them was that no one knew what was there, and the colonial powers, England, France, and Spain, all, and even Russia, laid claim to that territory. So how do we get it? without making them angry. They kept thinking, and they kept thinking. And Lewis is like, I'll go. This is awesome. I'll do it right now. No, you're too young, kid. Shut your mouth. You know, do your job. But Lewis is always, always thinking about this. And while working for the president, Jefferson finds, on a, on a daily basis, probably the closest thing to an intellectual equal he will have. Whatever he learned and taught Lewis, Lewis picked it up immediately. Oh, it's awesome. Did you think about this? So it stopped being work so much, and the two were philosophizing and thinking stuff up and making plans. 
like you know, two buddies at a you know at a at a camp somewhere or a sleepover, figuring all this stuff out. When it comes to Louisiana, there are a couple problems. Earlier, the government dispatched Andre Michaud. Oh, those French guys. <laughs> he was going to be a loyal American. He was a French, you know, fur trapper, and he was going to check the country out. And he, you know, knew some Indian languages. He was going to map the Louisiana Territory for the United States, and since he was French, it was okay with the French government. Well, he doesn't get past Pittsburgh when we find out, the president finds out, that he's really a French agent. They wanted us to pay for the expedition so France could take the Louisiana, Louisiana Territory. So Michaud is captured. All right. And, you know, you can't really blame Andre if I was French and... Or I was American, the French sent me off to scout some stuff out. I probably wouldn't care and give it to America, but different story. So he's busted. So we lose that opportunity. Lewis asked for, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go. Uh, I don't know. What are your skills? What are your talents? You know, you got part of the puzzle, but you're just, you're just too young. No, really, I can do this. I can do this. And... Jefferson starts to think, huh, keep my eye on Lewis. Maybe, maybe he can go on the expedition. He can't lead it, but maybe I'll send it. And so now Lewis starts to be assigned some more difficult tasks. It's the famous Federalist, Anti-Federalist battle in the formative American government. And one of the things the Federalists wanted was the army roster scaled down. They especially wanted to get rid of a lot of anti-federalist officers. Well, Jefferson assigns that task to Lewis. Look, you know most of these guys. You were in the Army. You traveled up and down. You figure out who we should keep and who we should get rid of. Now, remember, he was just a first or a second lieutenant. So you're asking a junior officer to rate and rank and call the list of superiors. Boy, that's going to make a lot of guys, whoever gets the axe is going to be, they're going to be hot. They're going to be angry. But Lewis goes about it in a very efficient way. And every guy he got rid of, he had a very clear, logical explanation. Maybe it's age, you know, bad leadership, you were wounded here, maybe we could move you here, or you could retire type things. And when he's done, the... Parties in Congress are ready to go to war over this. They look at his list and like, oh, yeah, well, yeah got to get rid of him. And, yeah, yeah got to get rid of him. And, yeah, he stinks too. And when they're done, even these bitter enemies like Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton are like, well, we really meant to say here. Good job, Meriwether Lewis. So he gains you know, organizational experience, draws upon his personal knowledge and his leadership, and shows a talent to balance the scales. It wasn't just all one side or the other guys getting canned. It was an, an even balance. So at this point, Jefferson begins to tutor him. Everything he could possibly think of. Um, they go to Monticello for weeks at a time, and the Monticello Library was vast, but it supposedly contained the largest section of geography about North America in the world at the time. Memorize these. Figure these out. What do you have? And Lewis just eats this up. I mean, he just it's just insatiable. He's now turned loose. He's sent to Philadelphia to study with the best doctor we had, a guy named Benjamin Russ, who invented a medicinal pill, an elixir guaranteed to purge and cure any illness made up of mostly mercury and gunpowder. <laughs> <laughs> People actually take those. <laughs> Watch that. Um, and a guy named Andrew Elliott, who he learned how to use a sextant, a compass. They would go out into the woods at night. They would go out, you know, on the river and um, in the bay and learn how to use all these navigational implements. And when he was done, and I think Jefferson in his mind, you know, knew what he was doing this whole I mean, he surely did. And he goes to Congress and he announces, my secretary, Meriwether Lewis, as a scholar and a woodsman, has no equal in this country. 
He, this, these are his credentials, and he has, I love this line, he has courage undaunted. Nothing scares this guy, nothing stops him. You give him a task, he will get it done. To me, it seems, in Jefferson's words, God put him on this earth for this purpose, to explore the Louisiana Territory. I'm going to send Lewis, not as a bystander or as a second-in-command. Kid's going to lead the expedition. Well, he's 27. Yeah. Look, I, you can't send him out there. I mean, well, 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 why not? Who else can do all the things that he can do? Okay. All right. And so one of the things the president does, nice little shot of Monticello there, you know, it's where it's, you know, always fascinates me. These are like some big shutters where the president's bedroom is, and people would walk up and gawk in there and like watch him read. I'm like, can you not leave the man alone? I'm like, whatever. But anyway, so they haul up at Monticello, they do all their you know, reading and work, and um, the plan is put together. Now, here's a big test. Jefferson says, Meriwether, you look right up what you think you'll need, and you let me know, and I'll see if we can pay for it. All right, here we go. So he goes shopping. He's also told to pick his team. Pick who you want to go with you to explore the West. Remember, your main goal is to find, and this is kind of, you know, Jefferson's gray area, the quickest route or an all-water route, preferably, to the Pacific and collect this scientific data. So Lewis is picking his team and what he thinks he's going to need and is given carte blanche to an, an extent. And Jefferson, the wily politician and genius he is, decides we're not going to hide this. I'm going to apply to France and Spain for passports for my guys to make this trip. And I'll tell England, too, in case they run into fur trappers, this is a scientific expedition, and we are going to share this material with you. So he's, Jefferson is clearly viewing the military intent of our core of discovery. With, it's all about science, and I need passports. I'm not hiding it. I'm not just sending them. I'm asking your permission, but my guys are going to go. When he's done... And this is just mind-boggling. He compiles a list. He says he's going to need $2,500 for all his supplies and $696 in gifts for the Indians. So figure, for $3,500, you're going to go all the way out west and all the way back. And Congress says, God, that's, that's just way too much money. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're going to have to trim that budget. Well, we just paid France $15 million. What's another $3,000? Like, what? No, you got to find a way. See if you can trim it down. And Jefferson's like, look, just do it. I'll find the money. It's one of the great things about being one of the first three, four, five guys. You can do stuff. What, you mean I can't buy Louisiana? Oh, oops, well, I already did. So, you know, pony up, fellas. So, um, ah. Uh, he needs uh, some implements. He needs rifles and, you know, food, fishing hooks. Um, he designs himself uh, empty cannonballs that they could hollow out and fill with gunpowder or pieces of shot and then reseal with wax and use them in a cannon. He has mounted um, on one of his um, keel boats. So he's inventing and creating this whole time. Medical supplies, food, rations, you know, um, you name it, you know, uh, carpentry tools, um, axes, navigational tools. And when he's done, he spends $2,344. He told me to trim the budget, so I cut a little off, and they're like, all right. He gets, he gets his stuff, plus the um, Indian equipment. So, Clark here, as we've been talking about Lewis, Clark born very close by, a few years earlier, is a little different. He has no formal ed education. He was, you know, kind of a second class and aristocrat. And when he's very young, his family moves to Kentucky. 
So he works as a young guy on the Ohio River. So he learns how the river operates, how to move equipment on the river. And he was a bright guy, but very self-conscious. One of the things that always makes me laugh is that he misspells the word Sue 27 times in his own <laughs> journal on the Corps of Discovery. I'm like, look, man, I don't, can there be 27 combinations, all right? He finds them. I don't know how, but, um, but he does. So um, also in Kentucky, he hangs out with his brother, George Rogers Clark, famous frontier Indian fighter, and he learns how to live off the land. He joins the Army in 1789, and when he's young, he's with a unit of, of new guys who they wipe out a Shawnee Indian camp. Women, children, old people, and he tries to put a stop. I'm like, well, who cares? They're just Indians. He's like, yeah, but they weren't, they weren't doing anything, and they weren't the guys that were after. And so he turns them in, and like, we're going to kill you, Clark. And he's like, well, okay, but you still didn't do what you were supposed to. So for his honesty and the way he's able to quell a tense Pawnee um, situation, or Shawnee situation, excuse me, um, he's promoted. He's made an A lieutenant. He takes charge of those sharpshooters where he meets um, Meriwether Lewis. But at 26, he says he's worn out and tired. He was always on the move, always, always, always moving. And very similar to him, Meriwether Lewis, when he left his farm to join the army, he was never in the winter in one place for more than, he was never in one place for more than a year the rest of his entire life. He was always on the go from that point on. And he had retired, he was living at home when he rescinds a letter. This is key, well, number one good decision of Mary Weather Lewis was volunteering to go on this trip. Number two, when asked who he wanted to help lead it, he goes, there's only one person I will travel with, and that is William Clark. So he picks Clark to be his assistant. Meriwether Lewis was given the rank of captain. He asked that Clark be given the same rank, so they were co-equals, Captain Lewis and Captain Clark. This is initially <coughs> agreed upon, but as they get going, um, Clark is made a first lieutenant. Lewis says that's garbage. You will refer to him as captain. He is an equal to me. I'll deal with this when we return. So he's always referred to as Captain Clark on, on, on the job. Um, Clark's job is to help pick the men. They need frontiersmen who are already there. It's cheaper to get guys close to the source. He was also an extremely good map maker. Great artist. Well, he couldn't spell Sue worth a darn. <laughs> all right, he could make a map better than nobody's business. And here is a stat that that is really mind blowing. When they leave, there are five million three hundred eight thousand people in the United States. One in every five is a slave. And if you look at where they live, two thirds of that five million live within fifty miles of the Atlantic Ocean. Like from here to Greensboro. So everybody is very tightly compacted this way. Once they head west, there's nobody there. Right? If you go to, we're talking about Wyoming before we started, you still, nicest bathrooms of any state in the United States, Wyoming. And there's also nobody there. Um, anyway, um, so um, when Lewis and Clark leave, a lot of people don't, that's, that's just not true. This is as daunting as any exploration ever, whether it's Columbus getting lost in the Caribbean, whether it's Magellan circumnavigating the globe, whether it's John Glenn orbiting you know, um, the, the planet. This was one of those journeys. It was dangerous, it was long, it was like traveling to the moon. Think of Apollo 13. Once they're out there, if something goes wrong, where are they getting help? All they have are the guys with them and their resources and skills and their knowledge. They can't cry for help. They can't call for an extract. Everybody there, they either don't know, and a lot of people don't want them there. Plus, what are the physical obstacles? What does the land and the terrain have in store for them? 
you got to guess because no one's ever done it before and hope you are correct. So once they leave St. Louis, very shortly thereafter, they enter in the heart of darkness. We don't know what it, it is there. So this is a, a, a journey at the time that was earth-shaking. You think about it this way. 1804-1806, they go out to the Pacific and back. Before them, nobody knew what was there. Within 35, 40 years of their return to St. Louis, we're building the Transcontinental Railroad. So that's how fast time evolved, from guys slogging their way up a deep river to building mechanical power railroad from coast to coast. You know, it was just that fast. But no one, they didn't know what was there. So here's where everybody lives. Um, these are states, and these are territories up in here this is contested territory, contested territory. England wanted this bad, what is today Minnesota. So they had to stay out of there. And if you look at the map now, if they wanted a quicker all-water route to the Pacific, they could have kept going up in here, but it was Canada. So they're forced to curve way down here and go through Montana. But you got Louisiana, France is still worried about it, even though they just sold it. Spain is in the game. Russia wanted um, Alaska for their railing operations, and there's the British involved. So when it comes down to it, this is a race to beat the colonial powers to the punch. Jefferson figured if we learn what's out here and we claim this, then we're going to get everything else. So how do we beat these guys to the punch? It depends upon 33 guys. Eventually it'll be 36 people as we'll pick up three um, along the way. When they leave, there was a tearful of goodbye, as nobody thought they were going to, you know, <laughs> all right, seeing a couple, woo, all right, you know, can I have your rifle if you don't make it back, because, you know, um, like the Jeremiah Johnson stuff. So, anyway, nobody thought they were, they were going to do it. They're walking upriver. Now, see some pictures later. You know, they're sticking poles in the ground and walking forward on a plank and then sticking a pole back in the ground and pushing the keelboat up the river. And their pirogues or canoes, they're <clears throat> digging upstream. And if you've ever done that, even if you take a, you're out, you know, on the intercoastal waterway and the tide's going out and you're, you know, doing this for a while, going like, man, I'm not going anywhere and your shoulders are exploding. It was that every day. They're going up the Mississippi, and then turning up the Missouri. They're going upstream every single day. Many times they've got to get out and take rope or leather straps and tow the cargo. And the way the currents are running is they got to a horseshoe bend, they would have to go from the west bank to the east bank to stay out of the current, and then when they rounded the bend, go from the east bank back to the west bank, where it was shallow, where there was less water resistance. So they're not going like 32 miles in a straight line. They're going like 64, practically, back and forth, back and forth. This is extremely demanding physical labor. Plus there's mosquitoes and ticks, and it's this, you know, the spring melt, so there's trees, you know, under the, under the water. They could sink the boats. They're running into sandbars. This thing is going to be tough, and they needed the right guys. Guys who were hunters, guys who were survival skills, they knew the wilderness, and had the, what they called the right physical and mental makeup. You can't take any idiots out there. You can't take a guy who's going to crack under pressure or a rabble rouser. And so Clark and Meriwether Lewis run them through different exercises. They do interviews. They talk to family members. They do all this research, and they pick their guys. A little bigger than one officer and 10 men. It's two officers and 33 guys. But off they go. May 14th, 1804, they leave St. Louis and off they go. First two days are hysterical. All right, Lewis is like, man, this is cool, but this boat stinks. I'm going to get out and walk a bit. And he takes his dog, Seaman, and they start walking along. And you know, he's always writing stuff, writing stuff down, excuse me. And, and making little drawings. And he sees a plant on a cliff above the Mississippi. He 
doesn't recognize it, so he crawls out to get it, and he slips and falls. And he loses everything, but he had his knife out trying to dig out the roots. He sticks his knife into the dirt and just rides it down, and it catches. And he's about 50 feet up on a cliff, and Clark and the men come by and go, You all right, Mary? I'm good. All right, don't worry about this. All right. Um, so that's one of the, the first of, of four times where um, he almost um, dies. Um, the men are back there just, you know, busting their butt. And they stop by a, a little settlement where they run into none other than Daniel Boone, another guy that almost made my list, another guy who does incredible stuff. Nobody really knows what a character and a lot of the accomplishments that, that Daniel Boone made. But they actually talked to like 80-year-old Daniel Boone. And while they're there, um, they learn that the military authority in St. Louis, the American military authority, a guy named James Wilkinson, was actually a paid Spanish agent. And as soon as in Lewis and Clark left, Wilkinson had sent a letter to Mexico saying, hey, they're going, and the, the Spanish government will actually send three teams to meander around the, Louis, the Louisiana territory trying to find the expedition, and their orders were to, to kill them all. So they barely get going. They find out that there are you know, people out there hunting for them. But an 850,000 um, square miles, good luck finding you know, the, the 33 people. So, but Indians were hired. It was an, an intense hunt. While there, um, a couple guys get into trouble. A couple of them get drunk, and they're not supposed to be. So we'll talk about their punishments later, or who they are later. But Lewis and Clark build a little, like, mud hobbit hut and lock them in it for 10 days. And say, boys, we're staying here for 10 days. Now, when we tell you there's military discipline, we mean there's military discipline. When we let you out, Say one word, we're sending your butt back down river. And one of them becomes a famous explorer, a guy named John Coulter, who will wind up exploring much of what is today Yellowstone um, National Park. So right away, they set the tone, important decision like three, all right? When we say we're going to do it, we mean it, all right? It's not like if, and, or well, yeah, that was just a threat. No, screw around, because when we leave, all of our lives are interdependent upon each other. So, um, here is the keelboat. Uh, there's a handsome devil on it. It's not that big. It would fit in this room. So you imagine, this is where some of the guys worked um, on the day. Some guys were on the canoes. But sometimes at night for safety, you got 33 guys on that. All right, talk about locker room tight. That's locker room tight. All right, I'll take my chance out in one of the canoes and just you know tie it up and hope the rope doesn't break. All right, I mean there's really and you got to think if you've been on like a family car trip, right? And you know your kids are fighting in the back, you know, there's, there's no you can't pull over. You know, I mean it's, you're there and you either get along or it's going to be a very long um, nasty ride. So Clark turns out. To be very plain spoken and direct, but he had one of those voices when he gave you an order, it wasn't piercing or, or cutting, but you did what you were told. So Clark is in charge of handling the guys on the river, drawing on his experience from working as a young boy on the Ohio, and he handled the men really well. And he spends most of his time monitoring the shoreline, drawing an accurate map with longitude and latitude coordinates that Lewis double-check as they go. And it's not too far into it, and today is what is Sioux Falls, um, Iowa, the first guy to sign up. My oh, God, I feel bad for him. Sergeant Charles Floyd, first guy to sign up and be hired on, was complaining of stomach pain. So he was given light duty, but on August 20th, he dies. Um, we believe now it was appendicitis, it just blows up. So the expedition halts, they go over with military burial, they bury um, Sergeant Floyd um, in Sioux Falls, Iowa. He is the only, and this is incredible, he is the only member of the Corps of Discovery to die on the entire expedition. 
and there was nothing you could do about it. It wasn't the expedition that got them. It was going to happen, and it happens right away. Near Omaha, Nebraska, they have the first Indian encounter. Some friendly Indians, the Arikas, make it out. Lewis and Clark put on their fool like Napoleonic headdress as they get out, and they read this long speech that Jefferson gave them, that he is their new father, and they're going to assimilate into American culture. The Indians are like, dude, whatever. And they're, they're given carrots of, of, of tobacco, tobacco twisted in a big knot. They're given one of those brass coins and some blue buttons. And they're like, yeah, dude, whatever. And, and you know, Lewis says, we would like one of you to go meet your great white father in Washington. The chief's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll go. So, um, that stuff was, 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 was great. To us, we were showing the Indians our power and our wealth that would make them want to join the United States and make them want to absorb American culture. One of the things that the guys took along was an air rifle. It was a French-made um, air rifle where it was like, almost like the old pump-action BB and pellet guns you pumped up the air chamber, chamber in the stock, and it was a gun that made no noise. And so while they're having these discussions, you know, Clark would pop out the air gun and shoot like a bird or a rabbit, and the thing would, would be dead, and he would go pick it up, and he was like, ooh, ah, they've got like, you know, magic, you know, like, yeah, put the little gun, you know, on the thing, you know, no noise, no silent. So I'm um, showing what we had. This is, in the picture, it looks a lot bigger than what it is. It looks like it's like the Washington Monument. It's not. Um, but this is, believe it or not, this is now um, Private Floyd's, or Sergeant Floyd's grave marker. This is his burial site along the Mississippi River. And then this one is kind of, it, it's um, Lewis, always up high on the mountains. Some people say he didn't want to get down there and do the back-breaking labor, so he was always walking on the cliffs. He was a captain. He wasn't going to be doing that um, anyway. But they would describe him, especially, you know, um, Clark saying, yeah, we're in the river. We're looking at all this great scenery. And we'd look up, and there would be Lewis up on a hill, you know, and he would just, you know, walk on. They said his strides were like a mountain man's strides. He gobbled up territory with this huge gait um, that he had. And he could move over land sometimes much faster than they could on um, the river. So tribes they encounter right away. The Eureka are great. Crow weren't too bad. You know, Omaha, like Peyton Manning, sorry for that. <laughs> All right. Omaha, you know, they weren't bad. Cheyenne are a little touchy, but it's the Sioux. They were the people that everybody was afraid of. The Sioux had taken land from all of these guys, and they were the warlike Sioux. <laughs> And it was the Teton Sioux that were the most powerful and vicious. And as the Corps gets into the Missouri River, you couldn't travel on it if the Teton Sioux didn't want you to. And they get into what is today Pierre, South Dakota, and they run into a huge band. And they get off and they put on their military outfit and they, they shoot their little air gun and they give out their presents. And at night, the Teton were like, yeah, this is great. Carries a tobacco, a little bit of whiskey, some blue beads, magic air rifle. They're ready to let them go. Well, the next morning, the chief wanted more. And as the guys were sleeping on the bank near um, their boats, they wake up and they see this giant you know, group of Indians coming at them. And they jump up and they run into the river. And one of the keel boats is pushed out in, into the river. Guys were hiding behind the other one, and Clark's like, no, 